Okay, look, I know Trials and Tribulations was supposed to be the next video coming up, but I also realized after doing Justice for All that guess what? Halloween is coming up, and I am damn sure not missing the chance to make a Halloween video this year. Even if it's late. Since 2021, I've been making Halloween videos on different horror-related games, and despite the fact that I tend to release those videos like a month or two afterwards, I've at least been consistent with it. Even with the amount of BS that's been drawn on me lately. But unlike the past couple of years, this year was kinda hard to find a game I wanted to review, as half the ones I wanted to do were from franchises that I eventually want to do a retrospective on. And yes, I know that I'm contradicting myself with the Resident Evil 2 remake, but can you blame me, like... The game is really good, plus I was on a Resident Evil kick last year, it was a whole day. Alongside Resident Evil, so many other survival horror franchises I wanted to do in the future were Silent Hill, Dead Space, Alone in the Dark, Fatal Frame, and Clock Tower, ooh, especially Clock Tower. And in my search for a game to talk about for the spooky season, I ended up coming across two of them. The first was Eternal Darkness, which I almost did until I found out that this game required multiple playthroughs to see the full story, which would have been fine if I had done it earlier in the month, though eventually I came across the topic of today's video, a game I've heard people recommend to others who love Parasite Eve, and something that's been piquing my curiosity for the past couple years now, that game being Galarians. Galarian was released on the PS1 here in the States on April 14th, 2000, and the game has you playing as an amnesiac boy named Rion, who after discovering he has psychic abilities, goes on a quest to not only find a mysterious girl named Lilia, but to also stop a rogue AI from eliminating humanity. Galarian was developed during a time where a good chunk of the industry was jumping on a survival horror bandwagon. Square did it with Parasite Eve, Konami did it with Silent Hill, and so on and so forth. And even though Alone in Dark and Clock Tower existed before the genre was popularized, in a way, those games assimilated some of the elements Resident Evil introduced or improved on, which is especially the case for Clock Tower 2 and The Struggle Within. Galarian's though is one of the few interesting games that breaks the mold, as the main character uses psychic abilities for combat instead of the usual gun or melee weapon, and there's an interesting dynamic with using those abilities and going through the game as a whole, but we'll talk about that later. Reception-wise, Galarian's had some mixed reviews. People loved the interesting twist on the survival horror formula, as well as the game's story and presentation presentation as a whole, though some felt like the gameplay was either too repetitive or found an issue with the AP system, and even though we don't have much in terms of sales numbers, Galarian's did well enough to get a sequel, a light novel adaptation, and a three-part CGI OVA called Galarian's Rion. Beyond that, I wasn't really able to find too much during my research for this video, but I did find something that was, let's say, very interesting about this game and the people involved. First, there's the developers of this game, Polygon Magic Incorporated. These guys are mainly known for Galarian's and its sequel, Galarian's Ass, but they're also responsible for some other games that were surprising, like Slap Happy Rhythm Busters, Incredible Crisis, and oddly enough, Disney Sports Basketball. Hmm. Okay, so a little bit of a fun fact for you guys. Disney Sports Basketball is often considered to be one of the most rare games to own on the GameCube. For what, you may ask, I don't even know myself. but. The most wild thing is how much this game is going for nowadays. The last interesting thing concerns one of the writers of this game, Chin Fa Kong. Not only was he one out of the two scenario writers for this game and worked on the Galarian's OVA, he's also responsible for writing some of Boa's early Japanese songs, a discovery that still feels surreal, at least to me, having listened to Boa since middle school. Now to jump ahead a bit, I really like what this game does. It's been on my list of other survival horror games to check out, and something I was excited about going into. I've heard about this game since 2019, and every time I've seen people playing it, it looked like a weird mix between the fifth element in Akira. As weird as that sounds, it felt 
accurate, especially when I was playing through it for myself. Though this game does do some cool things, it has issues mainly in the gameplay department, which in my eyes are ones that can easily make or break your experience. Despite that though, the story here in my opinion does enough to pique your interest to the point of seeing things through to the end. Like always, I will be supplying a timestamp down below and in the description so you guys can skip over the story if you guys don't want to get spoiled. With that out the way, let's get into the sci-fi horror. <laughs> In the distant future, we see a boy being experimented on and is eventually revealed to be our main character, Rion. Now, after he manages to get himself free, not only does he learn that he has psychic abilities, but he also learns he has no memories of who he is or where he came from. Regardless, Rion makes it out of the room he was in and soon begins to try to find a way to escape from this very, very weird hospital. And from this point on, the game begins, but this section doesn't really have much when it comes to direct storytelling. Most of it is environmental and are things that you find while trying to escape the hospital. Early on, you find an article about the disappearance of a family of three with your name mysteriously being listed. And later, you find a document detailing a project known as the G Project, with more about that and some other weird experiments being conducted here. And finding this stuff isn't like how it is when you find stuff in other survival horror games. The documents you find are relevant, but you're not going to know how important it is until sometime later. Just know that it adds a lot of mystery to an already mysterious circumstance. To add on to this mystery, while well, Rion goes to the hospital fighting for his life against guards, whatever the fuck these guys are, and robots, Rion keeps hearing the voice of a girl named Lilia, beckoning him to come and save her. And if the purpose of this section was to do that, then god damn it, it did it flawlessly, because I was so curious to see what was going to happen next. Now, after going through the horrors that is the hospital, Rion eventually makes it to an exit, but is then stopped by the director of the hospital, Dr. Lim. He's the one responsible for these very weird ass experiments that's going on that we've experienced throughout this hospital. And even though he looks menacing, we easily kill him by peeling his top back. Gotcha, bitch. Rion escapes from the hospital, and while trying to figure out who he is, he eventually begins to make his way home. Rion eventually makes his way back home, though it looks completely desolate and void of life. And as he progresses through the house, he begins to get flashbacks of his time with his family, from seeing himself with his mom and dad, to also discovering their dead bodies. Oh god. Also, off topic here, but if there's one thing that this game does a pretty good job of is showing how creepy things are. Maybe it's the pre-rendered background that feels cold and eerie, or maybe it's the fact that there's barely any music, and if there is any music, this shit sounds so industrial, it feels like I'm in an underground club somewhere in Europe. Maybe it's also the fact that the 3D models don't feel human for some reason. They look like clay dolls sculpted to look like humans, if that makes sense. If it doesn't, try looking them through their eyes. I guarantee it's gonna look very... Very empty. Alongside Rion having these flashbacks, he also has to continue fighting for his life against these Mr. X looking motherfuckers who not only have psychic abilities, but also look like Drake on Xempic. Or maybe a meth head. Either way, they look creepy as hell. Though after a little bit of exploring, Rion discovers his father's study, where he ends up learning from his father, Dr. Albert Steiner, get it? Like Albert Einstein? Ha ha ha. Anyway, about what's going on. Prior to the events of the game, Dr. Albert Steiner, alongside his partner, Dr. Pascal, created an artificial intelligence capable of self-replicating known as Dorothy. As he quickly grew and developed sentience, he ended up asking Dr. Steiner what her purpose was, with Steiner responding to serve humanity. However, Dorothy despised the way humanity was and began cultivating a sinister plan. First is the G Project, a little project we read about in the hospital. The project's goal is to create artificial humans known as Galarians that are far superior to ordinary humans on almost all levels. And if you know where this is going, I don't think I have to say much, but just in case you don't, there's a second program known as the Family Program. This one isn't as friendly as it sounds, as it plans to use the Galarians to wipe out humanity so that Dorothy would essentially become God. This revelation leads to Dr. Pascal and Dr. Steiner creating a virus in order to destroy the AI. But to ensure that Dorothy won't find out about it, Steiner hid it within his son, Rion, and Dr. Pascal's daughter, Lilia. And in order to unleash it, Rion has to find Lilia as the two together can unleash the virus. And from here, our mission now becomes a matter of finding Lilia and stopping Dorothy. However, just before Rion heads out, he encounters Birdman, the first of a couple Galarians we meet in the game who's also trying to find her. And after defeating him, Rion heads out to find Lilia in a hotel in the city. Now, I'm not going to miss words here. This section is weird as fuck. If I wanted to end this part immediately, I would tell you that Rion finds Lilia and the two heads off to try to confront 
run Dorothy after fighting against two other Galarians named Reinhardt and Rita. And saying all of that would be the end of things, but there's a little bit more to it. For a good chunk of this section, you'll be going from room to room talking to other people for clues on where to find Lilia. While gameplay wise, this shit is the worst. Story wise, it does something pretty unique as each room you go through has some pretty eccentric ass characters. And I'm not gonna hold you. These guys might have a Saturnity beat in terms of weird ass characters. Starting from the dirt floor, you'll come across a drunk man with a machine gun on his bed and a room full of ammo that makes you think that this dude is either preparing for a terrorist attack or is an arms dealer of sorts. Next, you have a crying woman who went through something pretty traumatic, but it's never really told what it is. Maybe it was a bad breakup? or it could have been something worse. I hope it's not the latter. And finally, a well-dressed man with a suitcase who rushes us to another character we meet on the second floor. Speaking of which, on the second floor, we have a fucking drug dealer whose room looks like a mix between a meth lab and a trap house. We're a mixer, I know, but if you're either from Florida or visit family that's over there or friends or whatever the case may be, then it kind of makes perfect sense. Next, we have the actual terrorist here who is building a fucking nuclear bomb within the hotel. I have so many questions, but the one I really want to know is where did he get all this shit from? Better yet, who's supplying this menace to society here? Fuck? Next, we have a man who looks like a priest, though his room looks more like a sex dungeon than anything. Oh, and look, he's trying to pull me in further into the room. Huh. Okay, yep, well that confirms it. That man is a predator. There's no way we can mince words here. He's literally a fucking predator. Wrong with y'all? You niggas are crazy! And finally, we have the hotel's plumber, Krovac, who, thank God, is the most normal one out of the bunch. Now, if you've enjoyed most of these characters, I'm sorry to inform you, but most of them are dead. If you end up going back to their rooms for a third time, you'll find their dead corpse except for Krovac. I guess. Wait a minute. Hmm. I might be looking too deep into this, but that reminds me of the seven deadly sins. It could just be me, but I, I don't know. You get to avenge their deaths by finding the one responsible, Reinhardt, and after defeating him, you find his sister Rita, who is a bitch and a half to deal with. More on that later when I talk about the bosses of this game. Now, alongside the weird cast of characters we have seen in the hospital, this section of the game does flesh out the Galarians a bit more. Besides Berman, who is very much a villain, Reinhardt and Rita are tragic characters that shows just how hypocritical Dorothy is in her goals. While the game doesn't fully explain why Dorothy despises humanity, you can imagine that it's because of the suffering that we bring on to others, and yet her plan to do so leads to Reinhardt and Rita developing mental issues, turning them into everything that she despises about humanity. Reinhardt suffers from split personalities going from a kind yet scared kid to a cold-blooded murderer. Then there's Rita who has violent mood swings that causes her to always lash out in anger when in reality she's not even like that. And all of this is to cope with the mistreatment they receive from Dorothy and the fear of them not being able to please her. Learning about this not only makes Dorothy even more of a tyrant than we already know, but it also humanizes the Galarians. Unlike Birdman who is more of a narcissistic character that enjoys killing, Rita and especially Reinhardt shows off that Galarians aren't all monsters and are just afraid of disappointing their mother, Dorothy. In a way, they have the emotional state of a child, which makes their situation all the more tragic. Now, I want to say they go more in depth with this in the light novel, but I can't say for certain since I didn't even dig to go and track it down for this video. But if you want to go check it out for yourself, I'm pretty sure it's somewhere on here on the internet just floating around somewhere. After defeating Rita, Rion and Lilia finally reunite, and after mourning her death, they head off to confront Dorothy who resides within the Mushroom Tower. Rion and Lilia fight their way through the tower, fighting against bizarre experiments created from the G Project. And just as they are about to confront Dorothy, Rion discovers both an empty pod and a pod that houses someone that looks just like him. The two are then confronted by the boy in the latter pod named Kane, a Galarian just like the others who fought and Rion's older brother. Huh? Kane reveals that Rion is a Galarian just like him and was created in the image of Dr. Steiner's dead son, and his whole reason for existence was to find Lilia and bring her to Dorothy. And this revelation leaves Rion shocked, yet he quickly denies that he's a Galarian, leading to the two brothers fighting each other. Rion defeats Kane and with his last breath tells Rion that he couldn't kill his own mother. So yeah, remember everything I mentioned back in the hospital section? Yeah, it was leading up to this. While it didn't surprise me in the way that I thought it would, I was blindsided by the fact that there was a plot twist in here to begin with. Most survival horror stories have them, but you can tell that it's there in some way, like how there's a traitor amongst the Stars unit in the first Resident Evil, or how 
how someone was working with Eve to create the ultimate being in Parasite Eve, but Galerius didn't really have that going for it in his story. The mystery introduced in the hospital kind of becomes solved once you get to Rion's house, and while there's the mystery of Rion's memory, they don't go hard on it as much until we meet Kane. Even though it's not much, especially since we're at the tail end of the game here, it could have been good, but it should just need more time to set itself up to feel more impactful than it currently does. In any case, after Lilia reassures Rion of his identity, the two confront Dorothy and manage to defeat her, but in the process of doing so, Rion ends up going beyond his limits to the point of death, and before he dies, he continues to ponder his identity and later tells Lilia that he's glad he met her, with the game ending with humanity saved and the proof of their victory being the destroyed tower that Dorothy was once in. Despite the premise being simple, Galarian's story does loosely talk about some interesting stuff. I already talked about Dorothy's motivation and how it affected the beings she created, and there's also the possible allegory of the seven deadly sins when talking about the characters in the Babylon Hotel, but again, I might be reading too deep into that. But the one thing that this story brings out more towards the end is about destiny and breaking out from what you were meant to do. Which in that context makes a lot of sense for our protagonist, Rion. The kid is basically a blank slate in the beginning of the game, and despite learning later that his mission was to find Lilia to bring to Dorothy, Rion broke out what he was meant to do after discovering his father's final message to him. This isn't talked about as deep as I'm making it, though oddly enough, his journey reminds me a lot of Roxas and his journey in Kingdom Hearts 2. Fuck! Ugh, man, it. <sighs> I'll get to this game one day, but not today. I do need Square Enix to give me an update on Kingdom Hearts 4, though. God damn it, I've been waiting two years for that shit. And I'm looking this. Mm. Other than that, I enjoyed the story. Rion was pretty cool, and I liked how strong of a character he is, especially with everything going on. The writers could have easily written him to be timid and afraid like Shinji from Evangelion. It also helps that he and his psychic abilities in the areas we go through reminds me a lot of Akira. And let me tell you this right now, this isn't going to be the only time I mission up Akira in this video. Even though the story was cool, I did have an issue with that plot twist I missed earlier, and besides Dorothy, Reinhardt, or Rita, the other characters are just okay. They serve their purpose, but just aren't as cool in my opinion. Maybe besides Birdman, but I think his fit more than anything. Matter of fact, while I'm thinking about it, I know the fashion isn't, you know, important to the game overall, whether or not someone's gonna want to play it or not, but I, I can't deny that the people with, like, how the fashion looks with all the characters and shit, it looks so freaking good. I can't tell you for the life of me what they were going for, but this feels alternative in some way, shape, or form. Kane, though, now that motherfucker looks like he's part of a visual K group. Well, the story overall is pretty standard for a survival horror game, but when it comes down to its gameplay, though, it's... It has a small spin to it. For the most part, Galerius operates like your standard survival horror game. Fix camera angles with pre-rendered backgrounds? Check. Take controls that takes a while to get used to? Check. Limited inventory and limited items? Check. And finally, spaced out save rooms? Check, check, and check. But like I mentioned earlier, Galerius does switch things up when it comes to defending yourself. There's no guns, knives, or anything to defend yourself with. Instead, you'll be using psychic abilities as your means of defense. At the start of the game, you have access to two abilities, with there being one more you can unlock later in the game. The first is Nalcon, which can produce a shockwave to push enemies away from you. And finally is Red, which can be used to set people on fire. Later on in the game, you'll get access to Defelon, which can create a force field around an enemy. Now I'm going to keep it a buck with you, this ability is heavily outshined by Nalcon and Red, especially since Nalcon is all you would really need. Damn near all the enemies in this game can easily be killed with it, and despite the fact you can set people on fire with Red, it's only really effective as a means to stun enemies. Now something to note is that when you want to use them, you have to charge it, which can make things dicey if there's multiple enemies on screen or you're in a small space, but depending on how long you hold it for, it can either be weak or strong. So like with red, if you quickly charge it, then the enemy will be smoking, but if you hold it slightly longer, then the enemy is going to burn up in flames. Keep that in mind, especially once you start going against the bosses in this game, because 9 times out of 10, you're going to have to be quick with it to survive. However, these abilities can only be used so much before it eventually runs out, and in order to refill it, you have to find the vial for those abilities, which are scattered around each area you're in. Unfortunately, the game doesn't make it clear to you where they are in any given room, and this includes items as well, so I hope you like searching for shit because you're gonna be looking around rooms as if you lost your glasses and can't see worth a damn. Now, something you might have noticed in the footage so far is that AP meter. As you play through the game, this meter slowly feels until it starts blinking, and the moment you begin to charge up an ability, Rion ends up going crazy and goes into short. This state causes Rion to slowly lose HP and walk slowly, however, this state also 
also allows you to insta kill almost anything you come across. And yes, this shit is similar to Akira and this oh guy I love it so much. Despite the cool benefit of one shining enemies, I do need to remind y'all that in this state, you are gradually dying. In order to stop it, you gotta find an item known as a Delmater to reset your AP bar. Now, if you did, you can stop the bar from filling up. Unfortunately, that's not possible because the meter continues to fill regardless of what you do. The more you use your abilities and or get hit by enemies, the more the bar will fill. And this adds a lot more micromanaging to the mix while you're already trying to survive in this game. Oh, and one last thing. I mentioned how you can almost one-shot any enemy you come across. Sadly, this state sucks against robots and most of the bosses in this game besides one we'll talk about in a minute. Even though this feature can be annoying, you'll be surprised that you don't even go into this state as much as you would think. Enemies in this game are easy to dodge and the only way to really fill this bar up is by intentionally getting hit. And it's even crazier that getting hit will more than likely fill the bar up compared to using your abilities, which in that case, Dang fucking god. Altogether, when you're actually going through the motions, it isn't really that bad. My only issue was with the tank controls, and it's maybe because I haven't played a game with these controls in a while, but they feel off somehow. I could be wrong in saying this, but it feels like how the first Resident Evil controls were, if that makes sense. Also, heads up, if you want the movement to feel a little bit more precise and you kind of like how it feels when you're using the analog sticks, uh, make sure you use the D-pads. Care for it, love for it, understand it, because this is what's going to help you when trying to get through this game, and especially against the bosses. Also, on unrelated note, uh, I know the Stadia was a failure, not exactly the best thing ever, but for some reason, I don't know what they were cooking over at Google, but this controller is so goddamn comfortable. I don't know why I said that, anywho. Now, there's a couple other things I have yet to mention, like the enemies, level design, or better yet, the bosses. So, I hope you like hard bosses and backtracking because this game is fucking filled with it. Hmm. In my opinion, the biggest issue with Galarian is the level design and bosses. It's like the game took the worst aspects of survival horror games and put it into one game that otherwise is pretty good. Now between the both of these though, the bosses are the worst things ever. And even though the level design isn't that bad, there's still some annoying parts to it. The problem with the level design is the amount of backtracking you have to do, and it's something that pops up as early as the first area and sets the stage for what you have to go through throughout this entire game. The hospital level, for example, has you trying to find and collect these blocks with animals on them, but that involves you having to go through a lot of back and forth to get a bunch of different keys and key cards to progress further, all of which starts to add up after a while and become tedious, especially when that one item that you might need is all the way back at the beginning area. Alongside how annoying some of these puzzles are, whenever you do have the backtrack, you might end up coming across these dudes with rifles who are annoying as shit to take out. And by the time you do all of that in this game, you have to do it again at the second and third area with some slight differences here and there. Now, when looking back on the areas you go through in this game in comparison to one of the worst areas, which we'll talk about in a quick second, uh, the hospital wasn't even that bad. Now don't get it twisted, the backtracking sucks like that's an issue that is across each and every stage you go through besides the mushroom tower but at least the hospital of Rion's house has some redeeming qualities to it uh the babylon hotel don't no nope, that shit fucking sucks this section of the game involves you moving from floor to floor and room to room trying to figure out where Lydia is. And the whole time you're going through this shit, you're going to be forced to see the same depressing and decrepit as rooms. And as I was going through this, the hotel was starting to remind me of a hotel in the worst part of New York City during the 70s. Or West Virginia. Or really any world's last urban ass hotel. Either way, they both look as old as our politicians in this country. Now, in terms of the puzzles, which is usually like a staple with survival horror games, some of them that are in this game are actually pretty cool, and I haven't even seen them in any other survival horror game yet. Maybe. Despite my annoyance with the Babylon Hotel, it does have an interesting puzzle where you have to knock on the door in a specific way. Something I haven't really seen done yet in any survival horror game, so that's pretty neat. And there's also the Mushroom Tower where you have to mask the color to the elevator by switching between Rion and Lilia. And I'm ashamed to admit this, but I had no clue what the fuck to do when I first came across this puzzle. 
Anywho, despite how annoying this all seems, the game does draw us a bone with the ability to use telekinesis. Pressing the triangle button lets you see visions of where to go next, though it depends on where you use it, because sometimes it just won't work and it isn't as advanced, which can also be said about the map in this game, which only really shows you the layout of the floor you're in, including the rooms as well. Regardless, they're unique, even if they aren't always the best. Now, level design wise, we can tell it isn't the best, but it isn't the worst. But in terms of the bosses in this game, Every boss in this game has three phases where they progressively get stronger, and when it comes to attacking, you have to be both quick with your attacks and constantly moving to avoid taking huge amounts of damage. Not to mention that these guys are durable than a motherfucker. Even if you consume an item known as skips that can make your powers even stronger, they can easily withstand the hit, so with the amount of times you might get hit, those items I mentioned before will quickly become useless if your health is below 50%. Now, in hindsight, there's only really two bosses you really have to worry about out of the six overall in this game. But those two bosses are annoying enough to the point in which you want to drill something out the window. And for my sanity going through this, I'm going to first talk about some of the other bosses besides those two, because at least the other bosses are easy as hell to talk about. And we'll also talk about the final boss as well. Mmm, that one is... For the most part, Dr. Elm and Reinhardt are the standard bosses you would see out of a survival horror game. I can't say much about Dr. Elm, because you could easily one-shot his ass if you're in the short state. But then there's Reinhardt, who's slightly harder, but not by much. He will try to walk towards you and or teleport from one place to the next. And even though he's easy to dodge, he can launch flames throughout the room and create lava zombies to hit you. Though the former is the one you really want to watch out for. With how telegraphed he is, the fight was mind-numbingly easy, though the one boss that is really unique and somewhat difficult is your fight with Kane. Kane's fight can be disorienting at first as he's constantly moving around trying to attack you, but for how quick and flashy his moves can be, you can quickly interrupt him by quickly firing your Nalcon at him. I know it sounds too simple to be true, but believe me when I say that you could possibly kill him without getting hurt if you're quick about it. But despite how easy those three are, Burnman and Rita are something else. Burnman is only the second boss in this game, but had me fighting him for almost an hour. His first phase is easy as hell as he teleports from one place to the next and eventually shoots you with a shockwave, and it's all fine and dandy until you reach his second phase, where he'll start making two other copies of him, with them each teleporting from one place to the next, doing the same shit he was doing in the first phase. Words cannot describe the amount of times I made it to this phase, only to get jumped by his clones, and the only way to really counter this is to be quick and perceptive of where he is, but good luck doing that cause those tech controls I mentioned before will fuck you here alongside the camera angles constantly changing. And if you somehow manage to get through this phase, then welcome to his third phase where he does everything again, but now more aggressive than ever. He can juke you now and appear elsewhere if you try to shoot at him before he shows up. And again, this wouldn't be as bad if you didn't have the controls and camera angles fighting against you. At least when fighting bosses in Resident Evil, the angles weren't overly intrusive and the boss AI was tough but fair. Eventually though, he does go down after about like an hour or two, but things only get worse once you reach Rita. Hell, at least the game decided to go easy on me before fucking me minutes after. The best way to describe Rita is that she's the devil incarnate. Her fight is a mix between Birdman and Reinhardt, with the addition of steroids. She starts off the fight by flying on the table and trying to hit you for a bit before coming down. And if you think you'll be able to hit her after she starts flying on her little magic table and shit, guess what? You only have a very small window to be able to hit her. Meaning that you need to be ready to attack after dodging. Like Birdman, the first phase is easy as hell, with the second phase being a pain in the ass. At least with Birdman's second phase, you could tell what to do after a couple attempts and be able to quickly respond. Nope, not for Rita. During her second phase, she flies on her table like she did before, but now she'll summon other furniture to hit you after she lands on the ground. So not only do you have to dodge the table, but now you gotta dodge miscellaneous furniture, all the while trying to find time to attack attack her. And if you somehow, by the grace of whatever god is out there, managed to get through all of that, you didn't have to deal with her third phase, where she summons all the furniture at once, 
Drones at you at the same time and then launches the table at you like a drone that's about to launch a missile. All of which you have to dodge quickly, or to be more accurate, pray to God the furniture's hitbox doesn't get your ass. This whole fight had me fighting for my fucking life. And no matter how prepared I became, I would lose in the most idiotic way imaginable. Like, I'm being so dead ass when I say that when you try to avoid the furniture, Half the time, you're still going to get hit, even if you're like, let's say, a couple steps away from it, you'll still get hit. And does it make sense in any way, shape, or form? Is there any way that we can kind of quantify this shit? No. Like, I, I, I don't know what the... It's, now, you would imagine that the final boss will be the toughest challenge yet. Yeah, it'll make Birdman and Rita seem like child's play compared to her. Dorothy is this big, imposing AI with human parts, which is extremely fucking creepy, but you get the point, right? You would think she would be hard, right? No. She's actually fucking easy. Sure, I might have died once, but this fight is significantly easier than Rita and Birdman, as her attack pattern is slow as all hell. And by the end of the game, I was asking myself, why are the two bosses in this game more difficult than the final boss? Why is it designed in a matter that doesn't fit within the genre? And what do we do that cause the developers to basically give us a big old middle finger? Damn, damn, damn! Despite my issues with Galarians, I can't lie and say I didn't have a fun time with it. The idea of using psychic powers as a means of defense will always be cool to me, and despite this game only really having four areas, they each feel distinctive from one another to make them stand out. And of course, there's the story, which while its concept is basic, its execution turns it into something that has a little bit more depth to it. Now, something interesting about this game that I haven't mentioned yet was the fact that it has voice acting. For the most part, it's not half bad. The voice acting here is between sounding as serious as it does in Metal Gear Solid solid and sounding slightly goofy like it did in Resident Evil 1. It also has a cast that you might recognize from other anime. Julie Maddalena plays Lilia and she's known for her work on Ghost in the Shell standalone complex as Tashikoma. Richard Epcar plays Dr. Lim and you might recognize him from his role as Joseph Joestar from Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. And finally we have Bo Williams who played Birdman and is known for his work on Cowboy Bebop as Shin. Overall though, if you're looking to play a survival horror game anytime soon, make sure to put this in your lineup. I guarantee that y'all might enjoy it. And with that, thank you guys so much for watching till the end of the video. I am glad that I ended up making this Halloween video and also it being relatively short because I ended up recently moving from Premiere Pro to DaVinci Resolve. I had been using the former for the past three years now and it's been a rocky road if I'm being honest. Sometimes the program worked for me and then other times the motherfucker would just either crash or I damn near just lose all my progress despite saving the damn thing. This isn't even including the fact that I had to switch from Adobe Audition to Audacity again and I'm just gonna say this right now, I hate Audacity and everything that it has become and so I had to switch all the way back to to audition. Don't ask me how I got it. Just know that uh, I have my I have my sources. Wink, wink. Nudge, nudge. Regardless, I'm looking forward to my time using DaVinci Resolve, and maybe in the future I'll go back to using Premiere Pro, but that won't be until Adobe doesn't try to violate my wallet. Anyway, at the time of me recording this video and eventually going off to, you know, go edit everything and stuff, I am currently about to go and get started on working on Trials and Tribulations. I already got the first case done back when I was working on Justice for All, and I think I might continue on working on it after, you know, I finish all this recording and I start editing and stuff. I don't know yet, I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm just hoping that this video, or not this video particularly, but the Trials and Tribulations video, I mean, is not gonna take long. I'm praying to God that shit doesn't end up being an hour long because that game, there is a lot to talk about. So it's just, yeah. Like always, make sure to like, comment, subscribe if you guys enjoyed the video and hit the bell notification so you guys know when the next video is gonna be coming out. And make sure to stay safe, Hydrate, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace!